based upon our basket. Um, our basket contains about 43% magnet rare earths. So when we compare that against a number of other, you know, other rare earth projects that are potentially being developed um, over the next decade, it does stand out. Hello and welcome to Assay TV. I'm pleased to introduce Tim Harrison, Managing Director of Ionic Rare Earths. And Ionic are developing the Makutu project of critical and heavy rare earths, which we're going to be hearing all about. So, Tim, welcome. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show and be discussing your project and the updates. So, um, just for viewers who might be new to Ionic, uh, could you give us a headline view of the company? Yeah, we, um, we've got a, a fantastic asset in Uganda. It's a large ionic absorption clay deposit. Um, uh, end to end, it's about 37 kilometres long. Um, we've got about 300 square kilometres of tenements now at Makutu. Um, we've completed about 12,000 metres of drilling. Um, we're working through or finalising um, getting the last two tranches of assays, hopefully reported over the next month or so, and um, looking at then doing a, a substantial increase in the resource at, at Makutu. So um, a significant update uh, coming in about three months' time, we expect. Um, and on the back of that resource estimate update, you know, that will then support the feasibility study moving forward and looking at, um, at moving forward with a mining licence application later this year. Um, yeah, so it's all go this year. Let's hone in on some of those assay points in a, in a minute. Um, but first, can you tell us a bit more about the geology of Makuta? You know, why is this deposit particularly exciting um, and why have you generated such international interest? So um, one of the advantages of, of Makuta and why it really stands out um, when looking at, at other uh, rare earth projects globally is it, its unique mineralisation being an ionic adsorption clay, it means that we're able to process the, um, the ore um, to recover rare earths using very simple processing techniques. Um, the mineralisation itself is near surface, so it's got a very low strip ratio. Um, processing via a heap leach, where we're effectively washing the clay um, to extract the rare earths in a chemical form. There's no radionuclides, um, so when it comes to the um, environmental and social licence to operate, we don't have those challenges that, that a number of the hard rock uh, rare earth projects um, experience. Um, the ionic adsorption clays produce a, a chemical precipitate, a mixed rare earth carbonate product um, that's elevated in the composition of magnet and heavy rare earth. So, when comparing the, the baskets um, for the ionic adsorption clays over the hard rock projects, they have a much higher um, basket value uh, right. and typically a higher margin. So they are, you know, very highly sought after deposits, but very, very rare. So um, there's a number of these deposits that exist in um, Southeast Asia, um, right. predominantly through southern China and, and Myanmar. Um, these type of assets produce around about 95% of the world's heavy rare earth supply as it stands today. Mm. Um, and so the, they are effectively the, the source of, of heavy rare earths today and, and will be going forward. Um, and it's provided the Chinese with a, a substantial advantage um, over a number of other rare earth producers over the last uh, 40 years, 50 years. Um, and so, you know, in developing Makutu, um, Ionic is, is looking at really taking that advantage of the mineralisation to produce a basket of rare earths that, that nobody else really can, can provide, um, you know, when comparing baskets. Yep, certainly. And certainly the um, attention and uh, industry, um, industrial demand, sorry, for rare earths at the moment across that basket is certainly on the rise. Um, okay, so what's the situation then with the um, with the licensing um, uh, around the project as well? Because as far as I understand, there's several licenses on the asset. That's right. So um, last uh, last year we we acquired or we, we um, applied for and was approved 
on a six license, an exploration license um, to the northwest. Um, that was on the back of some very encouraging reconnaissance drilling that we did out to the east and northwest. So um, we applied for a new tenement. Um, we now have got 300 square kilometres of tenements at Makutu. Um, the mineralisation itself stretches approximately 37 kilometres end to end. Typically, the mineralisation sits under about three metres of cover um, and the clay can range anywhere from sort of um, five, six metres thick um, up to some of the recent results, which were nearly 29 metres thick, which, are, you know, when, when looking at iron absorption clay deposits, they're, they're absolutely fantastic results. Mm -hmm. Yep, very, very much so. Okay, so why don't we hone in on that a little bit on your most recent assay results that you published in early January? Uh, so that was the, the fourth tranche of assays, and um, within that uh, set of assays, we actually uh, encountered numerous high-grade um, and near-surface clay uh, intervals. Um, we actually had uh, two intervals that were over 28 metres thick um, so, you know, when, when looking at the ionic absorption clays and the information that we've been able to sort of determine um, from, you know, the experience of, of, of Chinese ionic absorption clays, typically you need to find those thick clay intervals um, to be able to, to develop these assets. And pleasingly, we've seen that numerous, uh, numerous zones across the project where we've identified big, thick, um, continuous ionic absorption clay regions. Um, so we're, we're very confident on the, the potential for Makutu to move very quickly into, into operations once we complete the feasibility study later this year and, and ideally through construction next year uh, and looking at ramping up the asset in 2024. And you mentioned the feasibility study that you're going to look to complete in three months' time. What have you got to do in, in, in between then? Um, is there a lot more drilling to come to really... Uh, define this resource and, and, and check how much upside there is remaining? Yeah, so we'll have the, the mineral resource estimate update, which we're expecting will probably come out in April. Um, at the moment, we've got engineering underway on the, the capital and operating cost estimates for the project. Um, so that information will, will continue to be fine-tuned over the course of the next six months or there, thereabouts. Um, we've recently submitted our environmental and social impact assessment at Makutu. Um, so that's been lodged with the Ugandan government. We've got a, a number of community engagement programs that are um, underway in Uganda uh, as we speak. Um, we're building the team. And really, you know, we're, we're focusing in on, on having that mining licence submission ready to go later this year, probably around about the third quarter. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to get that application in and, 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 and secure a mining licence at Makutu um, as soon as we can. Yep. And how is the environment sort of in Uganda, you know, for mining? It's um, maybe not uh, the most prominent mining nations, but equally huge mineral resources. Um, the strategic importance of rare earths is obviously there. Do, do, do the locals and the government realise this? Yeah, so we've had um, very, very good engagement with, um, you know, various different uh, groups within, within Uganda, local stakeholders, uh, community level, um, government departments um, whom we deal with on, on a regular basis uh, and good engagement um, at a number of levels within the, the Ugandan government as well. So, um, you know, we are, I think we're, we're doing the right work um, we are genuinely looking at building a long-term partnership um, and engagement um, and collaboration with uh, our, our, our stakeholders in Uganda. Um, there's recently been a, a gold mine developed uh, approximately 100 kilometres to the east of, um, of, of Makutu. So there is international investment um, flying, uh, flying into, into Uganda at the moment. And I think, you know, once we're able to demonstrate uh, the ability to explore, um, develop a project and get into production, um, I think it'll be another positive step for, for a mining industry that's, that's, that's slowly building in Uganda. Mm, certainly. Um, what about infrastructure, though? You know, Uganda's landlocked, but obviously East Africa's a huge region for um, industry um, and natural resources. Um, it's a plan to, uh, you know, uh, um, export. You've got proximity to Kampala, I suppose. 
Yeah, so um, Adam, we're 120 k's east of Kampala. Um, we've got uh, immediate access to, to road rail and, and hydroelectric power. Um, right. So actually we've got a transmission corridor that runs um, uh, immediately adjacent to the north of the um, Makutu mineralisation um, trend. So um, we, we're very fortunate in that the infrastructure is already there at Makutu, um, which will enable us to, to move very quickly on the development of the project. So uh, also it's providing us with a step change on the capital requirement for the project because, you know, having all that readily available um, existing infrastructure means that, you know, it's not going to be required to be funded by the project. So um, yeah. we've got, you know, low-cost hydroelectric power running immediately past the project um, roads, rail, um, and, um, you know, there's a number of large regional centres around the, the, the tenements, um, 20 k's north of the town of Aganga. Um, to the east, we've got um, Bulgiri, and uh, to the south um, west, we've got um, Mayugi. So we've got regional centres where we'll, able, we'll be able to, um, to, to engage a, a residential workforce so no requirement for a camp um, and looking at a predominantly Ugandan workforce. Excellent. Um, fantastic stuff. So um, how are the financings uh, to date? You mentioned obviously those elements are helping on the cost side. Yeah, so we're, um, we're engaged, at, at, you know, with a number of groups glo uh, globally um, because of the unique appeal of the project and the basket. Um, I mean, the, the, the demand for, for rare earths, specifically the, the magnet rare earths and heavy rare earths over the course of the next decade is going to be um, far greater than the ability to, um, to bring on new supply. So, um, you know, we've seen over the course of the last four months um, approximately, you know, uh, the, the, the basket value of the, or well, over the last three months, the basket value of the, the Makutu project has gone up over 35%. Um, so it is substantial. We're seeing dramatic increases in the in the prices of heavy rare earths. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, the magnet rare earths obviously uh, have been, um, you know, front and centre of, of, of a lot of people's attention um, on, on rare earth pricing over the, over the last three to six months as well. So um, we're seeing significant increase in the basket value of, um, of Makutu's product. Um, demand for the project is, is very, very strong. We've recently um, announced the potential acquisition of a rare earth separation uh, technology company. Right. And, uh, and with that technology, we're looking at being able to, to develop our own refinery um, and potentially also look at magnet recycling. So, um, you know, we are looking at a, at a larger um, rare earth supply chain um, initiative and um, and I think you know the the potential for for Ionic to, to look at greater vertical integration into these new and emerging rare earth supply chains is is something of, of significant interest to the company. Yeah, it's hugely um, impactful. Would that be localized in terms of the refinery and the recycling facility? Are you looking to keep that base in Uganda or East Africa? Yeah, look, so, so given the, um, the, the technical requirements for, for such a facility, we are looking at the potential for uh, a number of locations. We're evaluating a number of locations at the moment globally. Um, you know, ultimately, the ability to, to build a, um, a more integrated uh, rare earth supply chain will mean greater involvement with um, potential downstream users, whether that be uh, OEMs uh, or component um, um, partners. Um, so we are dealing with and having a number of discussions at the moment on, on those new and emerging supply chains and, and where it naturally makes sense for a facility like this to exist. Um, and I'd also say that, you know, with going downstream and developing a refinery, um, and, and, a, and a more integrated refinery uh, metals and alloys play, mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at being close to the end users is, is probably um, of significant appeal. But also, you know, there's, you know, increasing subsidies and incentives that are being um, potentially available for, for a project like ours, given the, the unique appeal of the basket. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's um, yeah, and challenging indeed that you could implement sustainability across the and security on the value chain, but equally look at the end users and and look at the integration challenge um, as well. But great to have that vision already and be um, um, putting the pieces together there. Um, just on the basket, I wanted to ask actually, was there any indication that you're sort of you're producing or going to be producing? Um, one rare earth element more than the others do you have any sort of breakdown within that at the moment yeah so based upon our basket um our basket contains about 43 percent magnet rare earths so when we compare that against a number of other um you know other rare earth projects that are potentially being developed um, over the next decade it does stand out um on our proposed production um and our rare earth uh, or magnet rare earth production, you know, there's potential there that we could be a producer of or, or being a participant in the production of up to, you know, 4,000 tonnes per annum of rare earth magnets or permanent magnets. Um, that is a scale that has certainly um, piqued a lot of interest. Um, so, you know, when we look at our, our rare earth, our magnet rare earth capacity, you know, that is a, that's a driver in itself. The strategic advantage of our basket is also, um, you know, greatly aided by the fact that we've got 44% heavy rare earths in our, in our basket. So we have appeal in, you know, those future-facing um, thematics around um, net zero carbon uh, mm -hmm. policy. Um, so whether that be electric vehicles or offshore wind turbines, mm -hmm. um, you know, to name, name a couple of, of specific applications where there's, you know, a tremendous amount of policy and where rare earth supply chains need to be developed to, to be able to deliver those policy um, objectives. Then we have the, the heavy rare earths. And so there's potential applications in military and defence mm -hmm. uh, and communications so we, we have a number of different sort of strategic um, arms to, to the importance of Makutu, which means that, you know, when it comes to developing Makutu and developing potentially our, our rare earth supply chain, there are a number of individual stakeholders that will all come together um, to be part of a, a greater rare earth supply chain. And, and, you know, when it's looking, when we're looking at the, our, our product and, and our potential customers and partners going forward, you know, it, it's it's more than just one or two uh, potential OEMs. There's a number of groups who have the potential to greatly benefit from the, the rare earths that we're able to produce. Um, you know, in addition to that, we've also got substantial amounts of scandium. So, you know, there's there's a number of attributes to the basket that will be produced from Makutu, which means that we are going to have exposure to a number of, uh, thematics and, and opportunities over the next decade. Certainly. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Tim. That's really, really good to get an insight on the project and then the vision uh, further along as well. So we look forward to catching up later in the year and hearing how the feasibility study has come together. So thanks for updating us on Makuti. Thanks, Adam.